Uh, yep, so my name's uh, Adam, Adam Van Appledorn. Um, I'm a, a long-term doofer. I've been in the scene since, I think, 2003. Um... So um, I'm a little bit nervous. I don't know what we call this event. Back in like early, like in the 90s, early 2000s, like that money hadn't come into underground. So underground was still very underground. But now I'm like, uh, yeah, I've got to do it. It's like part of um, my soul expression, part of life. And if I don't do it, things are like evolving so quickly in this sort of digital art space that you've got to kind of evolve or you just get left behind. It's like a relic. I'd love to get some decks for like the DJs, but I'm a bit nervous about streaming to Facebook because they're, I've already got busted for copyright twice on Facebook. Because you had a bunch of like rock tracks and pop tracks and different things. And oh, well, since we're on the subject, uh, can you tell me what is progressive? <laughs> Shortly after that, there was Lada Massive, which came through, and I met, I met Tristan at a rave called Ping, and he introduced me to Lada Massive. It's about actually relinquishing control as, a, as an event promoter and actually allowing other people to come in um, to, to contribute. Well, the mixing quality was definitely lower, I think. There's more train wrecks than what you get these days. <laughs> Hello everyone, I don't know what we call this event, uh, well Adam, you put it together, uh, tell us uh, what, what this event is called. Oh, we, well, I guess we call it RPG, but we call every event RPG, so it's, you know, I, I haven't got a specific RPG number for this one. <laughs> okay. uh, Adam, uh, can you also introduce yourself for the viewers who may not know you? Uh, yep, so my name's uh, Adam, Adam Van Appledorn. Um, I'm a, a long-term doofer. I've been in the scene since, I think, 2003. Uh, listening to, um, like, underground electronic music since about 99. So, uh, but yeah. apart from doofer, you are also a, an artist, a DJ, right? Yeah, I play. I still play. Um, I sort of had a break. Like, I was pretty active for about 10 or 12 years, and then I had a break for a few years when I set up my new business. But now I'm like, uh, yeah, I've got to do it. It's like part of... Um, my soul expression, part of life, and if I don't do it, then you get uh, you get consequences from not not doing art. You know what I mean? Uh, I love it. I love I love the attitude. Uh, so, what's your DJ name? Uh, incongruous. And so, tell me, how did your music journey and this doof journey begin? Okay. So and when? And when? When? Yeah. So, started about 1999. I think the first, or even a bit earlier, but I think I think the first track that. I got, which sort of got me into all this, was Robert Miles' Children back in the day. And um, it was like my mate gave me some tracks from his hard drive and I listened to some of them. It also had, um, like, I Need Your Loving. Remember that? Yeah, um, yeah, from, yeah so it had that track and it had Robert Miles' Children. And I listened to those two more than I listened to his other ones because he had a bunch of, like, rock tracks and pop tracks and different things. And, you know, it's a nice mixed bag, but those two I just kept resonating with more uh, and then after that yeah I went to started going to sort of um, underground club nights in, um, in my year overseas in the UK and when I came back more so things like Stonefest um, there was like Fang Nights which used to play techno um, they brought like Derek May and, um, and, and artists like that at various times and, and raves at the ANU right and then and then shortly after that there was Lada Massive which came through and I met I met Tristan at a rave called Ping and he introduced me to Lada Massive and then um, after that, yeah, there was like, um, what was it, the side project stuff. So the side trance, you know, kicking in the Red Gecko days. So they were like the early days. And then from there, it sort of mushroomed out and uh, different events, different uh, promoters, different crews, different people. Yeah. Uh, well, tell me, how was it back in the day? Because when you started, it was still, uh, it was still playing vinyls. Uh, that must have been totally different to what it is uh, uh, now. W what do you have to say about that? Well, the, the mixing quality was definitely lower, I think. There's more train wrecks than what you get these days because <laughs> it was easier to mess up on a vinyl. Um, but we had some really good DJs who were pretty good at it, like um, all different genres. And, 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 and it was really underground back then as well. It's since like about 
somewhere when that electro house era came in, you know, like big money got involved in underground dance music and it changed, it changed things. It made it more of a money game. But um, back in like early, like in the 90s, early 2000s, like that money hadn't come into underground. So underground was still very underground. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was still raw. Um, and, and so the early parties, you know, the early doofs were like, like techno, um, really raw psytrance and drum and bass. They were like the three dominant sounds. And before that, you know, the old school rave days used to have like the happy hardcore, hardcore, UK hardcore, um, hard house, you know, those days. And that was also pretty raw and people were playing it on vinyl. So, uh, yeah, it's good. It's good. Like, I actually liked it more then, I have to say, than when after more recently. But um, I still think it's important to like find your new position in, in how it evolves, you know what I mean? Because it's always going to evolve. And in recent years, like the technology is coming in so fast and the streaming and so things are like evolving so quickly in this sort of digital art space that you've got to kind of evolve or you just get left behind. It's like a relic and yeah. it's like Commodore 64 consciousness, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> But do you still play on vinyl sometimes? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've still got my decks. I've still got like about four or five crates of vinyl. So I sometimes bring them out and play. It's a... And, you know, and then you transition from there into CDJ and you transition from there into Tractor and so now you've got to transition between the mediums a little bit, you know. I, I did try and digitise some of my vinyl but uh, it's almost, uh, it was almost not worth it. It's almost better just to um, still play it as, as is, you know, on the vinyl. Uh, so. well, what do you mean digi digitise your vinyls? What, what would you do to it? Wouldn't you just buy a, a, an MP3 version of uh, a track? Uh, or wh why would you want to digitize it? Oh, just so you could access it in something which wasn't a vinyl. So you could play it off like CDJs if you wanted to burn it to CD or you could burn it to USB or you could burn it, you know, you could put it on Tractor or something like that and play it like a digital file. But can, can't you just buy them already or some wouldn't them, it be easier? Some of them, yes. Like some of them are, you can just rebuy like a better quality download. But there's some labels where it's really hard to find like a digital vari variant. And one of the most epic labels that used to release was called Data Records, right? And it was like a Ministry of Sound kind of offshoot. And they had some really epic, um, really epic tracks, right, which were released on vinyl. Now, I was trying to find that through things like Discogs and other, other different online mediums. Really struggled to get that back catalogue. Some of these tracks I'm not going to find digital, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't know. I thought, I thought these days everything was sort of in digital format. You couldn't get a digital version if you wanted to. That's Just about most things, but there's a few that are still a bit out there. Um, so I guess that's, I don't know, I guess that's uh, something to sort of live with, you know. It doesn't, and it's nice to have a backup, obviously, as well, but you know, it's also nice just to actually bring the decks out, put a bit of extra effort in, you know, bring out a bit more equipment and actually still play the vinyl, you know. Um, I actually wanted to do a vinyl night, a vinyl only night at some point, you know, because it's been a while since anyone did one of those. Uh, well, uh, Matez, he's uh, learning how to scratch again and uh, he plays vinyls, he's got a setup and again, you've talked to him earlier, he, he, he is looking to, you know, make something happen. But in, uh, in terms of, uh, so you're, you're DJing, what uh, was what is the the most memorable party uh, at which you played uh, in when was it I don't know I mean some of the some of the early ones like the part the part B the part C the part D were in fact some of the most memorable because they were really early gigs for me and I was still still pretty raw like I'd still have the occasional train wreck and um, I was mixing like a, a weird variety of sounds back then that's why I called myself incongruous because incongruous means a bit weird it sort of like doesn't quite fit and that's how I felt, right? And so, and, and so I was sort of playing like, I play a combination of like techno, tech trance, like uplifting trance. And um, some of those early days were, yeah, were quite memorable because they were like dawn, dawn sort of parties, like the early earth call, like partying at dawn. Um, but in terms of big gigs, I haven't had like that many really massive gigs. You know, I've always been like a morning, a morning DJ. I've played some deep morning sets that have had profound impacts on people. I've also played some really long sets. So my, my longest set's like 13 hours, you know. Um, Damn, that's that's long. I've done some, yeah, I've done some long, like six hours, you know, three hours, um, sort of long journey type sets. And I don't always, always have like a very big crowd, but I'll sometimes have a few people around and, you know, they tell me that they've had like a bit of a journey sort of experience, you know. And that, so that's sort of what I go for these days. Um, it's really smooth. It's become more smooth since the move to Tractor and um, I can now just do it more, even more seamlessly than what I used to be able to do on vinyl. So vinyl, you know, because it's just a bit harder, a bit harder to program, a bit harder to be as seamless, you know. But now it's now it can be really seamless, you know what I mean? So I kind of like that. Um, yeah. 
Uh, that's cool. And in terms of your music preference, uh, uh, you mentioned you, you played a bit of everything, techno, trance. Uh, how, how has it evolved over the years and what is, um, has it changed much? Uh, and what, what's your current, uh, what, what, you, what, what are your current, yeah, maybe, uh, you, maybe you can name a few artists uh, that you currently really like uh, or a few labels. Yeah, sure. Um, so I started off, I was really into like the Detroit techno when it when I first got introduced to underground music. So my mate introduced my mate Wall. He kind of that was what he was into, and he took me to a couple of the, the early Fang nights, which played like that that Detroit techno sound, which had like that Berlin influence, um, that that American sort of techno sound pioneered by people like you know Derek May, Kevin Saunderson, Juan Atkins, coming from Dr Trezor in Berlin. Um, so I started off playing that. Um, but then, uh, you know, I also went to other nights where I'd hear like progressive or trans CJs and I'd have big nights out listening to that and I'd kind of go on big journeys. So I was into that as well. Like I love the uplifting. Um, played uplifting for quite a few years and used to play, when I moved into psychedelic, I'd play uplifting psychedelic in the mornings, which is different from what most other people were playing at the time because they'd all play during the night and I would just sit back and wait and wait and wait and then get to the morning and it'd be like, you know, like a disheveled dance floor with like just a couple of people still standing. And that's when I would play and I'd play uplifting, right? And try and like lift the energy back up and make it smooth. And um, so yeah, went from there into progressive, then back into Psy and I've been like oscillating between Psy trance and progressive like basically ever since. Um, I, now I'm sort of, main genre now is progressive trance. So it sits at just under Psy trance sound, although I have quite a lot of Psy trance as well. So I'm, I'm playing a lot of like 135 to 138, like European predominantly, not so much like the Australian Xenon sound like a lot of the other prog artists. So for some reason for me, that's I don't resonate off that as strongly as they do. Um, I appreciate it though, it's good. But um, my sound's like the European, so um, I play that. And um, I've been getting into also my side projects. I have like an ambient side project. So I do ambient sort of meditation or soundscape music, um, sometimes dark ambient, which is quite menacing. Um, and Chillgressive more recently as well, which is like a new variation of deep trance that's been coming out in the, since like 2016. And that's like 115 BPM or 110 BPM, um, structured like progressive trance but also with like ambient kind of element to it. So that's kind of the current sound and I can put that together in a, in a, in a flow, you know, in a night. Oh, well, since we're on the subject, uh, can you tell me what is progressive? <laughs> progressive, progressive is just really something that progresses uh, is the most basic term for it. And it re usually adds an instrument or adds some, some, some additional percussion every, uh, every phrase, every 16 bars. So, Every 16 bars there'll be some sort of change and it'll either go up or it'll go down or it'll drop into a breakdown. But isn't uh, sort of modern music like techno and trance, it's most of it sort of does it anyway? What well, does it anyway? Yeah. Well, yeah. that's right. Yeah, so, I mean, prog's really just like a sort of sitting in the middle of, the, of those two things in a way. Techno's actually a bit less structured, I would say. Um, trance still has big, you know, kicks on the phrase, like big drops on the phrase, big breakdowns kicking in on the phrase. Um, so you know, are, are you saying that sort of prog is between trance and techno? A little bit, but I think techno can be less structured than prog and trance. I think prog and trance has more inherent structure to it than techno. Techno can be structured just like prog and trance, and a lot of that, you know, we've got that progressive techno, I, I suppose, you know, it sounds like that. But some of the early techno didn't have that same structure, you know what I mean? It was, le it was more erratic when things would happen. I don't. I'm totally confused, man, at the moment. Uh, because, uh, like, what about progressive house? Where does that fit in? Progressive house has just got a slightly different baseline to progressive trance. So the progressive trance that I play has got the psychedelic baseline, right? That's what defines it as progressive trance. And you define it as progressive trance and not psi because it sits below 140, right? And at 140, something magical happens. You know about the magic of 140? No, I don't. Please tell. Me. 140. There's like a shift in brain patterns at 140. So if you're listening to something at under 140, if you're listening to like 138, um, the way you dance, the way your brain processes that trance state is different from if it's 140 to above. Right. So 140, when you cross over, if you're playing, if you're building up and you're going from prog trance into psi, when you cross over the 140, there's like something, something that's gonna shift, like there's gonna be a different style of dancing, a different, a different vibration. So is it more about the, the, yeah, the sounds, I guess, right? The, the, it is about the sound, but, it, but most of electronic music, it's it's progressive, isn't it? 
Some of it. Yeah, a lot of it. A, a lot of it. I mean, even drum and bass, you could say it's progressive. If, if you define progressive as something that changes every phrase, then most, most genres of dance music are going to have a change on the, at the end of the phrase. Um, it's just everyone has a different take on it, it seems, you know? It's hard to define. I mean, you probably have to ask Sasha or Digweed. I mean, they, they kind of started it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I, I also want to ask, you have recently been running some uh, live streaming uh, through, um, through uh, what is it, Twitch? Uh, Twitch. Uh, how has it been? What are your thoughts on it? Uh, uh, by the way, we have been filmed on, on the drone. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, need to get, we'll need to incorporate this uh, all into this interview eventually. But uh, uh, how has it been? What are your initial um, thoughts on, you've, you've tried a few already, what, what do you think? Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's, we're really small, like we're not getting a lot of views, but um, a few people have tuned in, we've got a couple of regulars, um, and it's been pretty fun. And it's, it sort of gives you, as a DJ, it gives you something to like, well, you know, you've got to make sure that you've got something ready. Or, you know, it keeps you sort of on your toes a little bit each week, so you don't just like slide into a week where you don't do any music. So um, it's been good for me in, in, terms of, in terms of that. We've been trying to get some people on the show. We've been trying to learn the tech. So it took us a few weeks to kind of get understanding of the tech. Now I want to upgrade it more. One of, one of our um, people who comes on, um, La Gioconda, she's got um, a, like a green screen now with some really interesting backgrounds. You had like um, one is set in like an ancient sort of fishing village the other week and then a pirate ship. She had like physical props. Um, you know, so I think if you can include that sort of uh, virtual background with the visuals, I'll be experimenting with visuals, um, both movies and kind of active visuals that you, you know, you get a bit more control over, as long as the multi-camera angles as well. So um, I think there's still a way to go for us. We need to invest in more equipment, um, but uh, yeah, we could potentially become an affiliate or, you know, get a few more people. I know like some Australian artists are doing quite well. There's um, like DJ Weaver, do you remember him? No, I don't. DJ Weaver's like a UK hardcore DJ. He's been, he's been around for ages, but he plays in like Sydney a lot. So he gets like 150 people tuning into him and he has all these special effects and pretty fancy stuff. And uh, maybe we could do it like that. And on Twitch, you know, if you're getting like 200 people tuning in at one time, you'd be near the top of the music because it's mostly for p computer games. It's not so much for artists. So when, you know, when your big artist streams or if and Juna Beats like streams something from one of their festivals, you'll get a thousand people watching. But if it's just like someone else, like an artist, um, if you are getting like a hundred or two hundred people tuning in at any time, there you're going to be one of the top channels on Twitch. Uh, but so. uh, are you currently doing only one camera, aren't you, or is yeah. it multi-cam? So we're limited by my, my technology at the moment, so I need to buy some webcams, and um, you know I've got a green screen coming in, so at least I'll have that part sorted soon. But um, yeah, we, we were trying to originally with the show was set up so that people would come on the show rather than just being my stream streaming me and then you know I go to your stream and you stream you and whatever. You can do it like that, but we we're sort of hoping to sort of have it a bit more like a show. Um, and it was a fun activity during lockdown, but I think it has application for you know developing artists and for creative projects for for lots of people. You know, uh, I mean? and you're streaming sort of only one only to. Uh uh, I guess to Facebook, right, and tweet, uh, uh, Twitch and, and Facebook at the same time, right, or, yeah. or other platforms as well. I've got a program called Restream which allows you to send to multiple platforms simultaneously. So it's like 15 bucks a month. It's used by businesses to kind of do a product launch. You might do it on like YouTube, Facebook, um, Instagram. You might go all at once, you know, with this program. So I've got a basic license which allows me to stream to three. But I'm a bit nervous about streaming to Facebook because I've already got busted for copyright twice on Facebook. So um, I'm a little bit nervous. I don't want to get busted a third time. So I'm kind of just streaming just to Twitch at the moment. And if I put anything on YouTube, I'm like making sure I cite all the artists and try and you know avoid the copyright and not profit from it and all that stuff. But um, yeah, it's a little bit tricky on Facebook. Some, I guess if you've got tracks that are really underground that aren't commercial, maybe you've got a bit more chance. But I was playing Psytrance and it was finding tracks. So it was even Psytrance is pretty commercial, you know, like. Yeah, well, they're get, getting on to everything now these days, uh, slowly but slowly. Yeah, even underground music is becoming, uh, you know, very accessible and very copyrighted. Uh, well, uh, what's next for you? What, what we're trying to do is, um, we are sort of, we're a really small crew and we don't have a lot of resources, so we're not going to be doing anything massive anytime soon. But we like the idea of like the boutique um, doof you know, as a form of artistic expression and um, as a way of like building community. And um, what we want to do is we sort of want to try and come up with a different model to what's happened in the past because over time I've noticed a lot of promoters 
you know, um, especially if it's like a single promoter running a party. Like a lot of promoters have like eventually, in, you know, even if they've run a lot of good parties, eventually they hit a party where something goes wrong and they just lose thousands of dollars. You know, or it's just them like holding up the weight of all the law enforcement or all the oppressive like political climate seems to fall onto the promoter. You know what I mean? And so I'm trying to like think of a way of doing it which doesn't involve like one person having to hold like, or even a crew having to hold all that weight. You know, how else can you build it in a more collective kind of way so that you can get these events happening out there and distribute the risk and give everyone like a stake in the project to like, you know, um, like want to contribute, you know, and I might run one which is a bit more like mine and people contribute and then you might run one for yourself, you know, which is your vision. And then someone else might run one which is their vision, you know, and we, we have to sort of do it like this because my vision is not the same as your vision. So my dream is to like, what is a sick party? It's not quite what you reckon, right? And so, um, so everyone needs a chance to sort of like create what they sort of are dreaming of, but you need to pull the resources to make so that each person's vision can become a reality. So looking at like a, how to create a synergy or how to create a more collective model by which you could like build little hubs which would then collaborate, you know, to build something. Um, and we realised that we can't really do it ourselves anyway, you know, if it was just my network or just the boys network, like we didn't have very big reach, you know, we'd been out of the scene for a while, like we didn't know so many people. So, um, yeah, we were small, you know, but there, there's a lot of people who were quite small, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and then you get a few small people and, uh, you know, you have a decent uh, uh, group, you know. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's the idea. And, you know, even just looking at the cost of a main stage setup, like, I was like, oh, I'd love to get some decks for, like, the DJs and, and a mixer. And we bought a really cheap mixer, and it's not really that great, and it's not really good enough, to, to be honest. And we still didn't have decks, and we're like, oh, this is going to cost 10 grand. Like, how are we going to do this? You know, how are we going to, like, and that was, the, that was the sort of challenge. But if you've got the network, distributed network, there might be some people who have already bought that, you know, and maybe maybe they would lend their equipment in exchange for something else, you know, or if you help them with their project, maybe they would lend the equipment. Um, maybe if you've got enough people, you could, everyone invite their friends, you could get an event from very little numbers to a good number. Uh, it's that sort of concept, you know, and um, more distributed, you know? Yeah, well, it sounds like a good idea, and I think there are a lot of people who have something and who can contribute something. It's just a matter of uh, getting them interested and uh, getting them a bit uh, organized and coordinated, I think. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think everyone, I think there's already like a bunch of crews doing their own thing. They've all got their own vision already set up. It's just how you bring the people together. Um, so, yeah, I've been sort of thinking about that uh, a little bit, you know, because for me, yeah, I need to do something. You know, I realized I, I couldn't just work and not do any doofs or not play any music. Like, I had to have an artistic outlet to be almost healthy, you know, particularly in lockdown. So, um, yeah, so I'm trying to like create my little piece, you know, but um, I need for that to be any good or to mean anything, it's got to be shared with other people who are bringing their own little pieces, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I think something like we're doing today already, look, uh, you have the music uh, playing there, I brought this, we're doing the interview, it's already something that people are going to watch it later and maybe also, uh, you know, want to contribute and get get something going you know that yeah well that's that's the idea the idea is that if you've got a project you know it's not just my project it's it's like what do you want to build you know and then and then if you've got access to like you know I'm calling it like the brotherhood it's almost like Freemasons or something you know what I mean like it doesn't have to be just just men though but um you know like the idea is that yeah you there's a pool of resources if you had enough connections you could start to create things and then all you need to do is find a way to kind of make it fair you know what I mean um, compensate people you know maybe if they're going to bring the equipment like you bring something else you know so it's kind of that tit for tat that circular economy you know uh, what do they call it uh, the potluck when everyone brings uh, right, uh, do you know what potluck is uh, oh, yeah. like an Asian food when everyone brings sort of a dish to a table and everyone has uh, you know takes yeah and you have a you have a massive feast right and it's way better than what you could have built yourself I mean this is what I realized is that what I was what my vision was like what I thought was sick wasn't what necessarily what other people thought was sick you know what I mean so but when you when you collaborate like that you get like a diversity that you can't you can't get if you were too controlling with it so it's about actually relinquishing control as, a, as an event promoter and actually allowing other people to come in um, to, to contribute you know, I mean, that's what I think it took me a while to learn that. I think I was too controlling at one point, you know, too, like, had my own way and, you know, it was just too abrasive. I think I've, I've learned from it, I think, over time. But whether I've mastered it, you know, I guess that's time will tell, you know, but <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, thanks for thanks for talking to me. Thank you. I uh, wish that 
your your dreams or what you're trying to uh, trying to do will produce some uh, you know fruits or at least personal satisfaction and I know it will produce personal satisfaction if that's uh, why you decided to do it it's a bit similar li like me I, I also thought oh, I gotta do something you know I, uh, I'm, I'm sick of sitting and not doing and just yeah. I gotta be part of it so thank you I wish you all all the best uh, thank you for putting this on thank you. thanks no, for thanks talking, talking to me thanks for, and thanks for coming this has been it's been cool you know it's cool it's cool to see your setup uh, and all the stuff you're doing as well so yeah thank you thanks very much uh, guys uh, stay tuned uh, and watch other interviews on my channel with other cool artists uh, we'll be back soon Bye.